Welcome to RSS DIT 2020. I am Dr. Shahu Ingole and you are watching me on RSS DIT TV brought to you by Vocard. Today, I am honored to have with me an eminent personality and renowned senior endocrinologist from Wellore, Dr. Nihal Thomas, sir. Sir is the professor and head department of endocrinology, diabetes and metabolism, CMC Wellore. Welcome to the show, sir. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with you. So, sir, based on your recent talk in RSSDI 2020, we would like to know what are the reasons for increase in the prevalence of adolescent and pediatric type 2 diabetes in India? And can you highlight the impact of the Barker hypothesis and the concept of the allostatic impact? Yeah, so essentially one of the most important factors that has led to the increase in type 2 diabetes in the last 20 to 30 years, particularly in the young, is the fact that there has been a major change in lifestyle. I don't need to uh, highlight this to the extent where I need to describe in great detail, but everyone knows that there are a number of studies, including from CMC Velo, which have shown that at a fairly early age, that children who are screened in school tend to have impaired fasting glycemia. In fact, one study done in Velo about 10 years ago by our team showed that the prevalence of impaired fasting glycemia was almost 20% in schoolboys who were aged 14 to 17 years, meaning that an impaired fasting glucose value of more than 100 milligrams was present in about 20% of school children from a tier two town. In addition to that, there seems to be a massive change in lifestyle right across the board, including that of parents and in children, and a lot of what we see is learned behavior from not only peers, but also from seniors. And the obesity status and the metabolic syndrome status in children is strongly related to the maternal and the paternal metabolic status. For instance, if uh, a child has an increased waist circumference, it is strongly correlated with that of the mother. If both parents have an increased waist circumference, the chance of a child having the metabolic syndrome is almost six times. So you have this massive uh, change in lifestyle, reduction in physical activity, and dietary consumption. Food is freely available, which wasn't the case, say, 30 to 40 years ago. But to add to all this, I would like to highlight the fact that other things like maternal gestational diabetes, which have also increased, could be an additional risk factor for the child. For instance, if a mother has gestational diabetes, various epigenetic uh, mechanisms are turned on, which ultimately lead to the child having an increased predisposition for developing uh, young onset type 2 diabetes. Now, the last two points which I would like to highlight in terms of children getting type 2 diabetes is poor maternal nutrition. In rural areas in some parts of the country, and particularly in people who have been exposed to a low socioeconomic environment at home, maternal nutrition in pregnancy may not be good. And this leads to low birth weight. This is the origin of what we call the Barker hypothesis. This low birth weight baby ultimately is a prey for what we call the thrifty phenotype hypothesis. The child, when it grows up, is at increased risk for obesity, increased diastolic hypertension, as well as diabetes. And in some children, this is markedly shifted to the left when you add on the additional risk factors that the child might have. Finally, I li would like to introduce this concept of allostasis to you. So what is allostasis? It's basically a concept of stress, a psychological or a psychosocial overload for the child. In a normal circumstance, it's good to have a minimal exposure to mental stress. This is a catalyst for ambition, this is a can catalyst for progress, for academic performance, and even sporting activity. But when the stress level increases 
significantly, it's not a good thing. The allostatic state in children is now extremely high. I shall give you a few examples. And there is a scoring system for children. If you have more than 300 points positive, the risk for developing type 2 diabetes in a child is markedly increased. So also other psychosocial or psychogenic related illnesses. So this increase is due to hypothalamic dysregulation. It's due to increased production of uh, hormones, stress-related hormones, which can all lead to an increase in body weight and also impaired glucose regulation. So how is the scoring system done for allostasis? Let me give you a few examples. If, for example, the parent has passed away or died, or if there's a divorce in the family, there's an increase in points for allostasis. The death of a parent is equivalent to 100 points. The divorce of parents is equivalent to 90 points. The death of a brother or a sister is equivalent to almost 70 points. Poor performance in extracurricular activities may be equivalent to around 50 points. An emotional break uh, at a personal level could be equivalent to 50 points. So when we start adding these, there are almost 30 different uh, variables which are present for allostasis. When we start adding these together, the child becomes increasingly prone for psychosocial related illnesses and one of them being type 2 diabetes. I hope this makes my point clear as to the multiple risk factors which may contribute and all these risk factors are increasing in the current milieu that we see today in childhood. So, sir, we would like to know how to diagnose type 2 diabetes in young and what are the differential diagnoses? So, that's an extremely good question. Type 2 diabetes in the young is a diagnosis of exclusion. If you look at the causes of diabetes in children, there are a number of causes. By far, at large, type 1 diabetes is the commonest cause for diabetes in children. Having said that, type 1 diabetes usually presents with a lean body habitus and may have osmotic symptoms in about 50% and diabetic ketoacidosis in about 30 to 40%. The other important causes in young people, not necessarily in childhood, but up to the age of around 25, people should consider the possibility of fibrocalcific pancreatic diabetes. Now, if you take type 1 diabetes and fibrocalcific pancreatic diabetes, both are lean causes for diabetes. These people are lean in habitus, generally speaking. And they have low C-peptide levels. And in patients with fibrocalcic pancreatic diabetes, the ultrasound will usually show calcification, which also has duct dilatation within the pancreas. So these are virtually ruled out with the markers of GAD antibodies for type 1 diabetes and the imaging of the pancreas along with the lean habitus. MODI or maturity onset diabetes of the young can also occur in children and also in adolescents. Now, these usually have an extremely so strong family history with an autosomal don dominant inheritance pattern. Having said that, patients with MODI have a, a general problem with transcription factors in activating the beta cell. And they usually have low to low intermediate C peptide levels. Type 2 diabetes, on the other hand, has in the initial phases due to insulin resistance, a mildly elevated C peptide level. The body habitus of a typical child or an adolescent with type 2 diabetes is that of obesity. And of course, we need to look at the definition of obesity in children. The BMI per se may have a shift to the left in younger age groups, and this should be taken into account. But the typical body habitus of central obesity and markers of insulin resistance like acanthosis nigricans or in slightly older adolescent girls, polycystic ovarian syndrome are extremely good markers of type 2 diabetes. Besides these conditions like MODI, which may be autosomal dominant inheritance where you 
might have to use next generation sequencing genetic methods for making a diagnosis, type 1 and fibrocalcic pancreatic diabetes. One should also think of other conditions wherein the weight may be borderline or slightly low, and this is lipodystrophy. Lipodystrophy usually is associated with insulin resistance, which is very significant. These children usually require insulin doses which are high, and they cannot usually be managed with just oral antidiabetic agents. They usually have uh, abnormal fat distribution. The partial lipodystrophy has a pseudo-Cushingoid appearance with increased fat distribution on the upper part of the body, but reduction in the lower part of the body. They also have other features and have a high propensity for early onset uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. But they may also have other dysmorphic features. And overall, their BMI or body mass index is not increased. In partial lipodystrophy, they may be normal to slightly low. In complete lipodystrophy, they may be extremely low. And the C-peptide levels in complete lipodystrophy are extremely elevated. So these, in a nutshell, include the differential diagnosis. And so making a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes involves a child who tends to be obese or at least has central obesity, has uh, features of insulin resistance, and then take into account, do an allostatic scoring, as I mentioned over here, and look at the other risk factors like poor physical activity and diet, all together put together may indicate that, yes, this child has type 2 diabetes. So, sir, from therapeutic perspective, how do we compare the management of type 2 diabetes in young versus those above 40 years of age? So, when a child comes to you with type 2 diabetes, the foundational aspects of management include an extremely good history and establishing the diagnosis with finality. Diet cannot be understated. But this is very often a challenge in school-going children and in adolescents. But the importance of regularity in mean, meal timings has to be stated. The importance of avoiding extra snacks. Stocking food items which are a temptation for, and which would cause a weight gain with extra calorie content at home should be avoided. The parents themselves have to set a personal example by cutting down what they eat and preventing themselves from snacking in addition. But of course, you need to also understand a child is a child and therefore the needs and the overindulgences that they occasionally take part in may have to be at times entertained. So this has to be balanced very carefully. When it comes to physical activity, one needs to take into account the fact that simple exercises like walking are just not enough for a child who's obese or who has insulin resistance. So what one may have to do is one may have to start a weight reduction program with intense exercises. For a child to lose weight, it's easy if adherence is there. And they should be encouraged to have moderate to vigorous physical activity for at least 60 minutes a day. What do we mean by moderate physical activity? It essentially means increased respiration with increased perspiration. So respiration with perspiration indicates adequate physical activity. And it essentially means that one should not be able to talk without pausing to take a breath. One other important point is that children should reduce they are non-academic screen time. What the guidelines and definitions tell us, that it should be limited to less than two hours per day. Having said that, two hours may be two hours too much. And therefore, one should probably try to reduce it even further if possible. This is a major challenge, trying to cut down time in front of cell phones and computers. When it comes down to... Uh, essentials of pharmacological treatment, metformin needs to be given to every type 2 diabetes child. When they are on diet and exercise, it has been shown 
that adding metformin definitely makes a major difference in glycemic control. Doses could be used up to 2 grams per day. And in addition to metformin, other medications have been tried out, but with lesser su success. It's interesting to note that the glitazones, when added to metformin, seem to improve glycemic durability quite a lot. So when you add on a glitazone to metformin, the chance of keeping the child on metformin for a longer period of time and not requiring insulin is far better. This is the advantage. Bearing in mind that, of course, glitazones can also cause additional weight gain. So we need to be careful. There are clinical trials with sulfonylureas and one such with glimipiride up to a dosage of around 3 milligrams has been shown to be beneficial as an add-on to metformin or as glimipiride alone. Having said that, one of the negative aspects of treating a child with type 2 diabetes is that the duration that you can have the child on long-term oral anti-diabetic agents in a large proportion, almost 50 to 60 percent, may be for much shorter than what you would expect from your experience in treating adults. So within about four to six years, a good number of children with type 2 diabetes may require insulin. And this is particularly true if they have failed to lose weight. So in summary, let me say that the aspects of lifestyle modification besides diet, exercise and medications also indicate the allostatic component. So psychological counseling with a child psychologist or a psychiatrist is extremely important because invariably there will be factors which have made a difference in terms of the psych of the child. And these need to be tackled very, very aggressively. So that, in short, is what you need to do for a child with type 2 diabetes. Thank you for your patient listening.